Greetings. My name is Bishop William H. Watson III. I am the prelate of the Texas Northwest jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. And uh, we're sitting here in uh, this magnificent edifice, this facility uh, that is called the Adamant Believers Council. And we are sitting here with G. Craig Lewis, who is the pastor of this church. Uh, God has done some tremendous things to him, and he's a, he's a body and a gift. I'm, I'm sorry, he's a gift to the body of Christ. And so uh, I, I thought it would be a wonderful ideal to uh, just enlighten uh, the, the, the country, to enlighten the nation, enlighten Texas Northwest on the things that God is doing through his life. He's a product of Texas Northwest. And uh, G. Craig Lewis, uh, my brother, my cousin, uh, we were first cousins, we are first cousins. Uh, my mom and your mom are our sisters. Yeah. And I saw uh, your dad and my dad were just like best friends growing up. Friends. And, and you're a PK. Yeah. Tell me, tell me uh, how it was growing up in, as, a, as a PK in Vernon, Texas. <laughs> I, I wasn't in Vernon. We would go to Vernon. Yeah, that's but right. My dad pastored in Vernon about three hours away from here. Okay. So we would ride to Vernon, Texas every weekend. Um, it's kind of cool uh, because it was like I had a different world to go to on the weekends versus mm. just home. Sure. So it was cool to go down there, especially, you know, that was back when pastors you, you know, uh, had a respect, uh, carried a respect level, like a, almost like a pilot of a plane or something. Right, so I was, right. a, I was an instant rock star in the town gotcha. because my dad was the pastor of the, right. of the largest, you know, black church there. So uh, I enjoyed, you know, being there and kind of carrying that status. And, um, but I really enjoyed um, church, you know. Yeah. I got my love for church from him taking us to church sure. uh, and always involving me. I mean, the minute he felt like I was old enough to do something, I was commissioned to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so I grew Typical up. PK. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a PK. That's the yeah. way it was. You yeah. know, we were called upon to do all the dirty work. And then once we got old enough, we could start doing some of the cleaner work. Right. But, you know, just carrying that mantle and assisting my dad in doing that, uh, it, was, it, it was great for me. I was never ashamed of it. You know, I never tried to hide it in school. I didn't care who knew. You know, he was pretty much my hero in that aspect. So, gotcha. you know, I embraced it at a young age and, you know, uh, the rest is history. I got you. So uh, things probably weren't always rosy, weren't always great. Um, share with me a little bit of your, uh, of your childhood kind of growing up. Uh, of course, you had some great times, and you know, probably some times that weren't always from, uh, always so great. Just share share with the people a little bit of your background. Well, you know, challenges of uh, you know at, at a at a young age, I, I I felt like I at a very young age uh, was when I began to really feel like I was called. Mm. I was I want to say around eight or nine years old. Okay, I felt like I was called of God to do something. Okay. But it wasn't, you know, the way I felt it wasn't in a good way. Okay. I was always targeted by the enemy, um, you know, through being or experiencing molestation and um, mm. being targeted by uh, that kind of thing. It always led me, you know, to believe that the enemy was after me for some reason. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever they had an altar call, I would go up for prayer to try to get it prayed off of me. Right, <laughs> right. But I will say, you know, that was back in the day where, you know, there were true prophetic voices or people that were really sensitive mm -hmm. to the spirit and they would always come to me. Yeah. No matter what preacher came to visit, no matter what was going on, by the end of that service, somebody was going to get up and call Craig out. Yeah. And they would always call me out and tell me. Yeah. The devil is after you. God has something for you. Gotcha. And so that helped me deal with what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I made the mistake. I never talked to my parents about it, which I should have. Um, I learned a lot, you know, from that. That's why I teach what I teach now. Mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> you know, I made it through those years. They were rough. Mm -hmm. But I made it through just 
you know, knowing that God has something for you can bring a lot of comfort to you. And um, not to get too far ahead of maybe what you might ask me later, but I feel like that's a lot of that is missing in the church now. Mm. Uh, young people not really knowing that God has a plan for them or it not being said or spoken to them gotcha. uh, because they're taking for granted that they are having a good time because they're smiling. Mm. You knew me growing up. You know, I was, I mean, if I wasn't going to make, if, if I didn't have you laughing within always, <laughs> always had a slap. five minutes, then right, it, then it wasn't me. No, at, so at, at all. I, right. I always had everybody laughing. Yeah, but at night, I you know I wasn't. It was a cover. Yeah, it was a cover because yeah. I I just you know I was going through a lot. Yeah, but it was those those men of God, those church, you know, those times when those people were selective to speak those words in me. Mm -hmm. It encouraged me and kept me going. And it helped me believe that there really was a God and he really had, yeah. you know, he really had his eyes uh, out for me. He was looking out for me. I got you. You know, I, I always, um, I say this to a lot of guys, you know, they want to, uh, how do we get to this? How do we do there? You know, how, how do we get to there in, in, the, in the ministry? And uh, one of the things I always say is everybody's path is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even though, you know, we grew up a, a few hundred miles away from each other, got to hang out in the summers, um, my path was different than your path, mm -hmm. you know. Um, your, uh, how, how did you eventually accept your calling into the ministry and, and come to be, you know, the EX Ministries, you know, uh, you know the originator? How did how, how, you get from... Uh, you know, I accept my calling in the ministry. I'm, I'm playing the drums. You know, he, he was a you know, phenomenal set player. You know, y'all want y'all want to know the original? This guy right here, <laughs> he can play the set, or he used to be. I don't know if you can I anymore. I used to be. Yeah, I am whack now. <laughs> right. But I used to can play. Yeah. But but your path, you know, was of course unique to you. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, I just I want to, want you to share with the people how you become from a you come from a drummer to this uh, this pastor of the Adamant Believers Council. Woo! Well, I mean, well, I mean, you, you can take yeah. a little break in between. We, we might ask some other questions. Yeah, I, I know that's a lot. Well, I, I will say this. Um, you know, the call of God has always been on me. I mean, I knew it. Like, there was never a doubt. When I was in high school, I went to a whole lot of proms. <laughs> and it's so funny. All the proms I went to, the girls I went to the prom with, and, you know, I preach against the prom now, but back when I was going to all the proms I went through, uh, but a lot of, you know, most of the girls were comfortable with going with me because they knew that I wasn't, you know, going to be, you know, sexual with them or anything like that because oh, really? I had, yeah, I had like a, I wasn't like a, a minister, but I could speak to the needs of people. It was really weird. So people were comfortable, guys, girls, they were comfortable spending time with me because I would always look past the surface mm -hmm. and have some kind of perspective that I could share that was just different. And all my friends would tell me that, you know, like when they were getting ready to do something stupid, we'd be at a party, everybody would be drinking or something, and then I'd walk up and I'd be like, I'm not gonna drink. So they would all stand by me, like, you know, you know, Craig ain't gonna drink, you know, and they would find comfort in the fact that I could say, you know, the reason why I'm not going to drink is because I don't want this or that. And so I, even though I was, yeah, you know, I was a nut in high school, mm, yeah. but there were lines I would never cross because gotcha. I just felt like God, you know, if he was going to look out for me with what I had been through, mm -hmm. then the least I could do was, you know, uh, not, not get too far out there. Gotcha. And so that's high school and then college, it was the same thing. But once I got to school at uh, University of North Texas, I started uh, an organization called BASE, which was Blacks About Spiritual Support. And I began to uh, bring, you know, uh, students together and we would pray and just talk about the Bible and different things. Mm -hmm. And we began to feed the homeless and, and we began to uh, do like a overnight sleep or for the foster kids in the mm -hmm. area, they could sleep over whatever. And it was weird because all the fraternities and sororities, well, all, a lot of the sororities on, on the campus began to volunteer and help, and sure. they began to help, and the, the fraternities got jealous. So they started coming to me like, dude, you gonna pledge, you gonna pledge, you know? And I was like, well, no, but 
I ended up, you know, me and, um, you know, some other guys I was with, we ended up being like the most popular guys on the campus just from that. So it was almost like wherever God would put me, yeah. I could never like hide the light that he would shine yeah. through me That's in any situation. It's, 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 in, it's interesting you say that hide the light because the first thing that came to my, my mind was you were illuminated for that area. Yeah. The Lord just shined his light on you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, everywhere. Like yeah. it was inevitable. It would yeah. happen. You drop me in any situation. God was going to find a way for me to use what he's put in me. Yeah. And it was just going to come out. Gotcha. And so from there, I came to uh, to my pastor, who was my parents' pastor, uh, Robert Sample, uh, Holy Tabernacle Church of God in Christ. And I was playing for his youth choir at the time. Um, and he uh, asked me to teach Sunday school. Mm. So I began to teach a Sunday school class, and I had two people there. Uh, and then my wife. So it was three, and Vicky and her belly. <laughs> Right. No, I think Vicky was born. Um, she was there either in or out, yeah, one way. One way, but, <laughs> one way or another, Vicky was there. Yeah, right. But, uh, <laughs> but I had two members, and every week I would preach to them like I preach now on Sunday. Is that right? I would, I would type up the message, put little pictures on it, format it, and print it out and hand, hand them to. Then two became 15. Then 15 became 30. And then eventually I was asked to take over the youth department and we had 200 kids. Wow. And we'd be busing them uh, in from the high schools. Then in the high school I was working in, I worked there for six years, I was uh, teaching music there and they would, um, they would put the troubled kids in my choir. Okay. And that turned into a Bible study. Gotcha. One day we had an after school uh, rehearsal and they kids just began to tell their testimonies crying and i began to pray deliverance over them and it became you know bible study and wow. so we would get kids from the school bring them to the bible study so it's like no matter what i did god was gonna he was he was just gonna use it first time i did the truth behind hip-hop um we were at that at a, at a church on halloween and i got some magazines and some record covers and I was showing people the Satanism in music. Mm. And, uh, and, but the stuff was hidden so, it was so covert. Like, everybody's like, no, nah, no, nah, that's not. And I would have to dig real deep because it was backwards messages and hidden agendas. And they would do stuff that nobody would recognize. There was no YouTube. Okay. So you couldn't go Google it and find out what it is. I right, mean. right. And so I began to do that, and man, when I did that, I remember the first time I did it, all the kids started manifesting demons and started casting out demons and doing that kind of stuff. And then, wow. and, uh, and then from there, yeah. I began to get asked to come and do it at churches. And so, so b b before you get too far, okay, um, in the in the youth ministry, is that really where you kind of accepted your calling, or, or you said? Uh, you know, Lord, I, I feel like I'm called to preach, or, or wh wh when was that point? It, w it was before the youth ministry. Okay. Uh, okay. It, was, it was before the youth ministry. I had pretty much said yes to the Lord um, prior to that. Okay. Because um, when I preached my first sermon, I wasn't married. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So I, I was already a minister. Okay. But it was just, I had the ability to really, really hold the attention of the youth. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I've always uh, admired is that you had, um, uh, of course, the ability to speak and people listen. Uh, but not only that, but you, you were you had a work ethic, and and I, I think people, uh, you know, pastors, youth ministers, people in the ministry, just think that, you know, you just start doing and things are going to happen. But it takes effort. It takes work. work, and so you 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 had the church van. You would got the you go pick up kids. I mean, yeah. so this thing that didn't blow up to two hundred people mm -hmm. by just sitting and letting the people come in. No, you went and got them. Yeah, yeah, we went and got them, and uh, yeah, my dad taught me work. Yeah, you know, old school. That's what they had. Right. They're like work ethic is what you passed over passed to your son, and so seeing my dad work hard all his life, anything I did for the Lord. I felt like it needed that effort. Gotcha. Uh -huh. EX Ministries is um, not just a national 
uh, nationally known entity, but it's internationally. You've been all across the country, uh, all across the world, really, uh, spreading the, the message of uh, the truth behind hip hop. Uh, and I know that's not, that's not all the EX Ministries comp- encompasses, but you know that's that's one of the major things. Uh, what is the the genesis uh, behind uh, the EX Ministries? What, what what is the start? Well, kind of like I was talking about before, it started, you know, with uh, in the high school okay. um, when we were gathered around, and the kids began to give their testimonies of the things they were going through. I mean, we had a guy delivered from homosexuality that night, teenager. He had been a prostitute in the streets of uh, Atlanta Mm. since like age 12, 13. Um, Had another girl who was, you know, sexually abused by her cousins Mm. uh, repeatedly. And these kids began to tell me all this stuff while we're in high school. And uh, so I began to pray for them and deliverance came and. And man, I just had, it seemed like God just began to give me what to say, exactly what to say to them. And, um, you know, that's kind of where it started. Okay. Uh, Because each one of them uh, had, you know, those testimonies, but they were all hungry for what it was I had to say, which I was, you know, I just had the word of God. Mm. And then God gave me a vision of... um, you know, the music industry and the vision is on our website and I talk about it all the time, but he gave me a vision of the music industry because at the time, heavy metal was, you know, what a lot of the uh, Caucasian churches were dealing with, with the white kids or whatever they were. I say Caucasian and white. I'm so not politically correct. But um, (laughs) both of that that group, they began to deal with, you know, they had uh, guys that would deal with rock and roll. And God uh, gave me a vision and showed me that, Mm. you know, in the future, it's not going to even be about heavy metal and rock and roll. But the devil was going to manifest himself through the art form that we know as hip hop, the subculture. Well, at the time, I mean, we was just pop locking beats and rhymes, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, beats. I mean, there was no real, you know, no devil in pop um, that we thought. And so it was hard for me to conceptualize that, but God began to show me that it would be real and that he was going to use me uh, to warn the body of Christ about this upcoming threat. And, be- and the reason being is because the devil, as I begin to research, found out that, you know, in heaven, that's what he fell from. That's being a exactly musician, right. And his music being able to, you know, lure a third of the angels away from the presence of God there must be power in music. Absolutely. And me being a musician, sure. I began to experiment with it because I was playing for churches and different things. And I saw how, you know, I could make or break the pastor's message. I don't care what he had to say. If, he, right. if, I, if my check wasn't right, right. it wasn't going to go over well. Yeah, that's right. like, <laughs> but, uh, but that's what change I, his key. <laughs> right. That's what I mean. I have him straining an A flat boy. I right, have right. veins in his head. But, um, I began to, you know, learn the power of music and I began to study. So, I mean, immediately when God showed me the vision, I, t- I began to study gotcha. and begin to learn. And I wanted to learn everything I, uh, I could about music frequencies, you know, what was going on in heaven through the Bible, uh, the devil, all of that. And so I began to, you know, speak the message, like I said, and man, it just like all of a sudden God began to just open up doors for me to go. And, you know, at first it started, I would go in Texas to different places. Mm -hmm. Then I began to go to different States. Then of course I began to go to different countries and then ultimately different continents. Um, And I just saw God warning. I knew that this message meant a lot to him because of, you know, the information he gave me one, but then how, fast he was moving me around the world to get yeah. the message out because there was no youtube there was no right. social media right. Right. you know and so yeah. i began to expose the illuminati and the hand signs the backwards messages you you, you got some blowback from that too i got real i got death threats yeah. and jay-z made a song about me and you know the, that industry began to send people to the concerts and different things when I would go, um, I mean, to, to, to my uh, engagements. Right. Picket you, try to picket block you me. from getting in, all that. Yeah, we yeah. had, they were out there with picket signs. I mean, 
I mean, because it was like me against the whole music industry. Well, you know, and then the Christian folks, <laughs> they saw me blocking their opportunity to get secular uh, platforms. Right. So they right. began to attack me. And after the world left me alone, the church kept, <laughs> the church kept fighting. But now you, you've never been shy of calling names. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking you to call no names today. I'm not asking you to call no names today. Because you know I will. Oh, yeah. I, yeah <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's not this kind of interview. That's not this kind of interview. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, 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 but explain the reason why you, you will call out a name versus just kind of speak to the, the, um, the topic. I will. I, I, yeah. and, and my reason is biblical. Okay. Um, there are times in the Bible where it tells us to go to a person. Um, when your brother sins against you, the Bible says you go to him okay. in private. Um, but when a person does something publicly, the Bible says rebuke him before them all. And the reason why is because you have to hold that person accountable for what they have done publicly. Gotcha. The best example in the Bible is when Paul went to Peter. Mm -hmm. Peter was, I mean, Peter was the man. I mean, right, right. And in everyone's eyes, he was equal to Paul as apostles. Right. But Peter began to act one way around the Jews. But then when he got around the Gentiles, he tried to act like he wasn't with the Jews. But when he got around the Jews, he tried to act like he wasn't with the Gentiles. Yeah. Paul saw this and Paul said, I rebuked him before all of them. Gotcha. He didn't take him in the back and talk to him. Mm -hmm. He rebuked him in front of all of them with his authority because what he had done, he was proud of. Mm -hmm. So Peter wasn't hiding it like a shame. Peter thought this is what should be done. Gotcha. And that's the issue we have now. Like when I call names of people that do things, they're doing these things. They're proud of. Regardless of what the scripture says, regardless of what the Bible says, they do it in public. Okay. I don't deal with their private sins. You don't ever hear me calling out what someone did privately. These guys have families. They have children, wives. I wouldn't dare get up and, t and expose anyone's secrets with the platform God has given me. Right. We've been doing this. Uh, I almost called you Bill. Uh, Bishop. Bill's fine. Oh, yeah. Bishop Bill. <laughs> BB. No, we've been doing this for 20 years. Okay. There's no way we would be able to do this for 20 years uh, if I was a loose cannon and God could not trust me. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, he trusts me to know. You know, I almost quoted it uh, Willie Nelson, when to hold them and to know when to fall. <laughs> <laughs> know when to walk away, know when, know to, when run. to run. No, no, but he does. He, he trusts me in that because I know how to discern if this is if this is private, I'll go to a person private. Gotcha. But if it's in the news on right. social media, if it has been broadcast by the person from a from a vantage point of I am proud of this, this is the way it should be then I bring the word of God and bring light to it Expose and show it. that, yep. no, this is not, according to the word, this is not how it's supposed to be. I got you. you now, so you, you've you been on this evangelism uh, field. By, by the way, your dad was an evangelist as well. That's right. Uh, but you, you've you been on the uh, evangelism field for several years. And then um, at some point, you know, the Lord kind of called you to settle down a little bit more and just in the DFW area and, and start a church. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me what that's, what that transition has been like. Cause that, that, that's uh, you know, evangelism, you know, you're in, you preach, you're out. Uh, church, you have to deal with all of the day-to-day mm -hmm. -day stuff, all the issues of, you know, people from day to day, all that kind of stuff. What, what, what has that transition been like for you? Well, I mean, I'm good now. But when yeah. I yeah. <laughs> when when God first called me to do it, I, I could not believe he had called me to do it. And mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, if you want to do it, then you're probably not called. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's usually God taking you kicking and screaming. Uh, uh, here. <laughs> yeah. 
he's right on that. Yeah, I, I, but I'm, um, I'm a witness. So I went through a period of shifting where my compassion, you know, because as a as a itinerant evangelist traveling, man, I would go in, get all the demons riled up and then get on plane, and come home. Right. <laughs> Preacher be called, man, you better come back and do something about these demons. Nah, that, that's, that's on you. I'm, I'm off the clock. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, so I did that for so many years, but transitioning to pastor and I had God had to raise my level of compassion, my level of understanding, yeah. my level yeah. of poise. I can see that. And um he did that by really just totally reconstructing me. And mm. I went through a period, I have a video about it, uh, uh, Era of Man Pharmacos, where I talk about the sickness that I experienced. And your okay. dad was mm -hmm. probably the most instrumental person in helping me get back to where I needed to be during that period. Um, but, mm. uh, you know, by taking me to his doctor and all those things, but my body began to shut down and I had to deal with, you know, childhood stuff, had to deal with, what was, you know, um, I had to deal with what was going to make me deal with people better. Gotcha. Right. You know, anybody can travel, preach, go in and leave. You could have issues like that. Yeah. Nobody's around you long enough to experience it. And I've always looked at what EX Ministries had done as carving a path mm. because that path wasn't there prior to EX Ministries. You know, yeah. I mean, I can stick my chest out and tell you that. Everything you see going on on YouTube, all this exposing and the truth behind and the secrets, we started all of that. Yeah. Like nobody was doing that at the yeah. time. So I was getting kicked around, talked about, my name was in the mud and, and people would still bring me to town uh, because of the deliverance that they would experience with their children. Mm -hmm. So my credibility was the deliverance and, 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 and what's going to happen when this message comes. Right. But, you know, I had to experience what I was giving to people. God put me through a period where I had to experience and trust him just like that mm. uh, for my own deliverance from things that I went through, all the stuff I was telling about, the molestation, all those things begin to surface in me so God could deal with them because you're going to have a church full of people that are dealing with similar things. And so mm. I had to experience it first. And once I did, you know, I felt like I was better. I would be better prepared to deal with uh, what was, you know, what the people were doing. I got you. So, you now have a, a thriving church, like I said before, at, at the very beginning. Um, approximately 450 people. I mean, and it's something that you birthed, you started. Uh, how many years has it been? Eight. Eight years. Eight years. Uh, like, again, like I said, a wonderful church. You have a, a, a big congregation of young adults, you know, families, men with with wives and children uh, and that kind of thing. And, it's, and it's, it happens to be the age range where, uh, you know, people say that these, these, this group of people are falling away from the church. I, and I, I don't, I hate to use the word millennial, but it's that, it's that, that, uh, that generation right below us, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, well, I, I am what I am, but, uh, <laughs> it's that generation I'm below you, I think. I'm yeah. Like... Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> no, not generation wise. Oh, okay. No, we're we, the same we, generation. We both X. Generation. We, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We still, we both X. Uh, you, you, I ain't that much older than you. <laughs> now we tripping on this, on this video. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, but you've been very successful in reaching that demographic. Mm -hmm. Uh, what has been, you know, what has the Lord shown you and what has been that, that, thing that it because you know there are a lot of churches going around a lot of churches out here now that are losing that that demographic of uh of people you know i got one word i got a one word answer for that and that is truth mm. you know the bible said that you know in the last days or in this day knowledge would increase well as knowledge increases people's access to truth or what they perceive truth uh is easier People are, you know, a Google search away from knowing pretty much anything they want to know now. I mean, it's that instantaneous. And so if a church isn't or if a pastor or preacher isn't ready to embrace that mentality and mm -hmm. be challenged by it, um, then he loses the attention of, of this generation. But is now and I, I hear you. Uh, but I, I believe that there's several pastors out there that would say, I'm telling, I'm, I'm saying the truth. I'm telling the truth. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe it's a style. Maybe it's a, a certain message that you're trying to get across. 
uh, well, I, I well when know. I say truth, I'm not just talking about black and white writing in the Bible. I'm okay. just not talking about scripture, scriptural truth, but I'm talking about the application of it. Okay. You know, um, some things that the church got away from is sound doctrine. Okay. The Bible says to hold sound doctrine of, you know, utmost importance. Well, what does sound doctrine teach us? Sound doctrine is behavior. Okay. The whole uh, book of Titus that deals with the, the, the chapter that deals with sound doctrine, that's all it's talking about is our behavior. Gotcha. That's the truth I'm talking about. Okay. It's the, it's the behavioral truth, meaning, you know, teaching a woman to, you know, take care of her home, love her husband, love her family, be discreet, Wait, be chaste. You mean women are supposed to take care of the home and all that? But what if they work? What if, you know? If they work, then they better figure out a way to be a keeper at home because the Bible didn't say nothing about working. It said- Are, are you a male chauvinist? No, I'm just sound doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and that's, that's always my thing. Right, like, right. I can't be really argued with because it's written. Like what I'm saying is in there. It's in the Bible. It's in there. And, yeah. and the older women are supposed, the age women are supposed to teach the younger women first to be keepers at home. That's, gotcha. that's the first thing they need to learn. Well, that's what I mean by truth. Right. Keepers at home. Now that may be a challenge for some to get, get there, but you got to get there. Mm -hmm. And by the preach word, it becomes established in the mind that this is where I have to get. You know, when we were young, they bring in a, 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 a evangelist mm. and he would just preach hell. Yeah. And we would know that because he's preaching hell, we got to get to heaven. Right, right. And he would scare us to death. We get on the altar, we repent, and we'd be saved for a good six, seven weeks. Right. We'd be doing good <laughs> until the message began to wear off. Right, right. And somebody else would have to come yeah. and reinforce them. Dude, who do we think we are? God had to do this with the children of Israel. Right. In the wilderness, he That's had true. to keep reminding them, open up the ground, swallow them up. Send bees, send walls to locusts. He had to keep right. doing stuff because right. Right. if he waited too long to reinstate what was being, if Moses waited, Moses waited up there and took too long to get back with the Ten Commandments, what happened? Ground had to open up and swallow them. Korah yeah. had taken over. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they took over. Yeah. That's what the Hebrew Israelites and the, you know, all of these false religions, false movements are doing. They're just taking over because the church is waiting too long. They're, they're in themselves too much and they're not, you know, pushing this truth out there like gotcha. they need to. And so when it's reinstated, when it's uh, when it's constantly brought before mm -hmm. them, like like we do here at the church, I preach it every week, just constant, constant. So it'll finally sink in that, OK, yeah. It's supposed to be a keeper at home. It's supposed to be discreet, keep my home's business. It's supposed to be chaste. I'm supposed to be this. Then the young men, I'm supposed to be sober. I'm supposed to be the provider, the protector, the priest of the home. Have a job. Yeah. So when these things are constantly reiterated, then when you start falling off, the message comes and it straightens you back up. Mm. That's what I mean by truth. But That's if true. you're just going to get up and bull corn yeah. on Sunday because you same, know say the same old thing the same old, old thing you know. and it's not sound doctrine it's right. not applicable and these young people aren't able to apply it to themselves and gotcha. where they are gotcha. then they get bored and they move on I got you as we kind of wrap up there's a couple of questions I, I want to ask uh, of you um, so this young man is is being called to the ministry what, what is your ministry, your, or young man or woman, it's been called the ministry. What is your message to that young man or young woman? I mean, it depends on what they call, what they feel their calling is. I mean, to, to a word, to, to speak. Uh, to speak, um, I, preach. you know, what, what I did when God called me to preach, I went and preached. Okay. Didn't look for a microphone, didn't look for a stage, didn't look for a platform, didn't look for a building. I started right there where those kids needed me in that high school. Uh, and I think that's where everyone should start. I mean, how is God going to call you to preach so you can preach in a church? Right. I don't think he does that. I think if you're a preacher, then you just preach the word. Yeah. Where, wherever you are. The in message. season and out of season. Right. In the building and out of the building. Right. But, you know, we were taught, you know, and that's just Pentecostalism. As soon as you get a call, 
they ordain you and then they move you in the line and move you in the rotation and those kind of things. And I think a lot of preachers begin to covet that yeah. because especially if they don't have in this, I don't want to get into this, but if they don't have authority in their home, they're going to look for the platform of the church to have some authority. That, that goes right. all the way back to slavery and the man's, you know, the, yep. the slave standing on the soapbox. It's the only time he had authority. Exactly. And so people will begin to covet it. But if people just did, you know, the work of the ministry and, and you know, spoke to people when uh, God led them to, then they wouldn't have to have a microphone and a platform to come. Mm -hmm. Just just preach where you are. Preach where you are. Yeah. And you don't have to you don't you don't have to be behind the pulpit to preach. That's why I started in Sunday school with nobody yeah. watching. I thought about something else that I want to address and then I'll come back to my last question. Um, tradition. Uh, you you pastor a very non-traditional church, uh, but you had a, a foundation in in tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me how how tradition has played a role, and then uh, in, in in your formation, and maybe even in the, in the church that you pastor, and then and the things that you you know you might have to deviate from uh, as it relates to tradition, the traditional church. It's a good question. You're pretty smart. I, uh, you know, I do all right. Yeah, you know. But <laughs> somebody, somebody told me that once more time. You know. <laughs> no, but, uh, well, tradition is important because tradition is where discipline comes from. You know, it's what the, it's what the law was in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You would not have the New Testament if you didn't have the law. The law set the stage, uh, and though it raised the bar too high mm -hmm. in, a, in most areas, mm -hmm. it, there was still a bar. Yeah. Got to have a bar. Got to have a bar. And so tradition brings the bar. Uh, that's where I got my discipline in studying the word. That's where I got my discipline in living right. Uh, mm -hmm. They raised the bar so high you felt like you was going to hell every night. Yeah. If you didn't repent. But that didn't hurt me. You know, that that's like getting a whooping. You mm -hmm. know, a whooping, a whipping is extreme, but it brings discipline and it makes you think of that the next time you want to wild out. And it's the same way with, with, with tradition. Mm -hmm. Tradition has the ability to do that. The issue comes, though, when tradition becomes holiness. Now you don't have scripture. Now you've, you, you, you've, you've mixed our man-made ideologies and disciplines with the word. With yeah. the word yeah. And you can't pull them apart. And the Bible even speaks a little bit about, about that, uh, about tradition that, that makes the word of non effect. Of non effect. Well, that's what I was just getting ready to oh, say. Okay. It, okay, and so it, it won't. Yeah. Let me be smart for a second. <laughs> it won't. Uh, <laughs> but it won't. It, it, they, they get fused together. Yeah. And that's where Hebrew Israelites, five percenters, mm -hmm. nation of Islam, all of these guys come in and point out those inconsistencies where you fuse man and God together. Mm -hmm. And they're able to lead many out of your movement because. You can't reconcile that. Like you can't explain that biblically. And so they use that. I understand it because I grew up in it. So I know where they're coming from. Right. But you still have to keep the biblical soundness. Right. Because if you don't keep the biblical soundness, someone can poke holes in what you're doing. And that leads people astray. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's good stuff. Um, and so the last question I have, uh, and, and this is for pastors that you know uh, old or young that m might have might be a bit discouraged um, because of you know it just you know it seems like their their ministry is not going anywhere um, what what kind of message would you would you say to those that man that woman uh, or that no back it up yeah yeah, you that know man, you better back that up. That is a whole uh, other that is <laughs> whole other discussion. Yeah, yeah, we, we can we can spend another hour on that one. <laughs> man, uh, yeah, the man. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll address the man. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, we can spend another. We, 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 yeah. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that 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 man that has been called to pastor is pastoring, uh, and maybe have been successful at one time, but still, you know. He's, he's experiencing a dip in his ministry or he's tired or what, what, what do you say to that guy? You know, it, it's 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 in the Bible, uh, the seven churches of Asia, you know, in Revelations, Christ addressed those churches. 
Mm-hmm. And the unique thing he did, I did a whole series on it. It's on our website, mm-hmm. exministries.com. But right. the unique thing he did, Christ did, was he didn't kick anybody out. He didn't sit any of those pastors down. He didn't close any of those churches. He told them to repent. Repent. Usually when they're, you're feeling like that and there's a dip, it's time to repent. And ain't always, you know, every time we hear repent, we think somebody done went off and done something. Right. No, it could just be you following what you saw someone else do and not following God's innovation. Or it could be you are taking your church in a direction that God has not sanctioned. Mm. All of that requires repentance. Gotcha. Because that's what was going on in those seven churches. And God said, hey, repent. And that's what I say. Repent. That's what it takes. You know, we I repent all the time and I do it in front of everybody. I'm I'm pretty transparent here. You know, I did mm-hmm. a series called Sins of the Father and that series dug deep in me. And mm-hmm. those things I had to repent in front of the church about. I had to repent to my wife about because I had processed some of the things from my childhood the wrong way. Gotcha. And I had to get it right. And God brought it, brought me to a screeching halt and, to, and said, hey, mm-hmm. you know, what's, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, what's good for the audience is good for the preacher. So yeah. repentance is good for us all. Our problem a lot of times is our arrogance or we feel we're in a position where we're too something so, so we can't get down on that level. Yeah. But man, uh, God is God and we are nothing. Exactly and so happened. once we embrace that, then if we stay before God honest and with a repentant heart, he'll work with us. Okay. He worked with those pastors. Like some of their churches were trash. Yeah. Some of them should have been, Thyatira should have been just burned up. <laughs> Sorry to say, these churches were tore up. He yeah. didn't close any of them. Well, he, he said, hey, repent. Repent. Get it right. I, I, I want to fix this because y'all are the church. Y'all are my representation. And until I come back, y'all have to be me in the earth. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, my brother, my cousin, I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Um, this is awesome. Uh, God bless each of you. I hope this uh, really helps you in uh, wherever you are in the body of Christ. Um, this is the man, G. Craig Lewis, pastor of Adamant Believers Council. God bless you.